What's going on, everyone? I'm here with my friend David, and we just watched La Ventura, the 1960 uh, watershed film from Michelangelo Antonioni. And I'd like to get his initial response on it. I thought it was an interesting film, and thanks for having me, by the way. Um, <clears throat> this one was... My initial impression on the film was that it was going to be like a love triangle kind of love interest. And it turned into something a lot more than I expected. Um, at the same time, the pacing is very slow and methodical. It's almost like the filming was different from its time period because I've watched several films from that time period and it did seem to challenge the status quo of how filming should be paced. Oh, certainly. Yeah. So I thought, saw that... Ugh thought that was pretty interesting. The other half of it is um, I was also interested with the thematics, which I will get into later, the mm. thematics of what Antonioni is trying to express in this film. I so. love that you brought up the pacing because that is probably the most frequently used criticism against the film is, is the pacing, but I think that they're just refusing to accept almost the uh, the function of the pacing or the symbolic metaphorical function of the slow glacial pacing of the film. Mm -hmm. And remember my initial response to this film, it was my second Antonioni movie. I had watched blow up before this and blow up like identification of a woman, like the passenger, all four of these films are anti mysteries. And the idea that La Ventura is a film about a woman who disappears, who goes missing. And you have all of the tropes, all of the, mm -hmm. All of the things that you can make a thriller out of, all of the components that you can make a wonderful mystery out of, and Antonioni circumvents them or subverts them exactly in verses all of these ideas and does not play into any of them whatsoever. And I, I call it an anti-mystery, and you can see where Stanley Kubrick got so much inspiration from films like La Note and this, where uh, certainly in films like Eyes Wide Shut, which are also like anti-mysteries. And it was, it was very interesting. It, it's not a deconstruction of, of, of mystery films. It's, it's completely its own thing. It's mm -hmm. not, it doesn't even pay homage to Hitchcock, not even slightly. It's just, like, com compositionally, it's just com incredibly, incredibly unique for me. But I can see why a lot of people have problems with Antonioni. He is a love him or hate him uh, filmmaker. I personally love him and I respond to his films uh, very well. Very well, and of course, uh, I always like to point out that he is a student of neorealism, um, of Rossellini's school of thought, he and Fellini, and you can see that in early films from Antonioni like Il Grido, and from Fellini like La Strada or Knights of Cabiria, but then they both went their own unique ways and pursued their own filmic languages. Uh, Fellini obviously went completely surrealist, and Antonioni went like literal symbolist, mm, something like that. Right. Um, like, like, like you, uh, you weren't criticizing it or anything, but you were saying it does seem incredibly straightforward. And I, and I do agree as well, but I think it's like inspiringly straightforward because even the metaphors are literal. Like you hardly right. have to, if, if you're available to pick up what Antonioni is trying to express, it's like right there in front of you. You just have yeah, to add exactly. two and two together. But so many people don't do that. So many people don't uh, like that that scene we were talking about of Claudia and Sandro uh, when Anna first goes missing, and in between them is a, an inactive volcano, and it's just it's kind of and the, the sky is dark because there's a storm, and it's just foreshadowing the adventure, the affair, the la aventura that they're going to pursue. It's just two plus two equals four, but so many people, I guess, are so terrible at filmic mathematics that they just don't appreciate the film at all. I see. I would like to dive board off that and point out that a similar um, literal metaphor was uh, happened, happened pretty much not even five minutes after that particular scene when that's like pretty much when Anna disappears and you never see her again. In the film. Yeah, she was already gone at that point. Yeah. Oh, she was already gone at that point. So then there was just slightly before just slightly. Okay. And then that's when she's um, walking up the wall of the rocks 
and it's like rubble and you're seeing literal metaphors before where she was cast behind a giant stone wall yeah and so she was stubborn and wanting to refuse to accept or she was refusing to accept the shallowness of Sandro's love exactly and that's, and that's what it was that was literally a expressed metaphor. yeah a complete and then, literal metaphor and then thereby following that is the next scene which I was just describing where she's in a pile of rubble she's accepted it it's her the illusion has been shattered exactly. and so she walks away and basically disappears it's a fantastic then, way to get across the visual information though it is sure. fantastic what I found was interesting about that though was how it took a particularly masculine right uh, perspective because the feminine perspective would be to follow this woman on her adventures and what did she do in that time period but instead of that that mystery element being dissuaded that way instead he, he does something completely different Antonioni is just like oh well I'll just ignore her completely exactly he sidesteps it but yeah. you don't get um, it's not like watching a Godard film or a Tarantino film like he sidesteps it but doesn't have any kind of any kind of attitude about it there's mm-hmm. no rebellion in yeah. this movie he's just it's like the only way he would know how to tell this story like it just doesn't even seem experimental on his behalf because he doesn't have that kind of that kind of rock and roll feeling or kind of any kind of feeling not even an avant-garde feeling it feels so uh disassociated from everything that, yeah that's what i would say yeah disassociated and what do you think the role of um Architecture, I think, plays a larger part than just aiding the the, uh, the the literal metaphors. Of course, this is part of a trilogy that Antonioni made, which is called On Modernity and Its Discontents, and it includes uh, La Ventura, Lake Cleese, and Red Desert, all of which feature his muse, Monica Vitti, in different situations, but all of them try to reflect uh, discontented, beautiful people in I guess, a uh, modern society, right? And I, I don't know exactly what I was picking up, but it was somewhat, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's a motif that recurs in his work, so I already, you already know what to expect slightly, that the, that human beings are almost non-reactive, they are, but, but they're reflective of everything around them. Um, I think that the best instance I could use to maybe take that word salad and, and make it make sense is uh, when Sandro is kind of wandering around, I think near like maybe the last quarter of the film and finds the, the sketch, the unfinished sketch of the, uh, I think it's like the, a gate over a cathedral or a doorway or an arch, something like that. Yeah. Like but an it's, arch. It's an unfinished sketch. And for some reason that just screamed to me, like, like while these characters, well, like maybe geophysically descriptive, they're they're not they're non-reactive, but that I think that goes to like um, uh, they're like existentially in, in impenetrable aspects of all of these characters. They uh, that, that they're not only so empty, but they're so empty or so clear, so see-through, so transparent that they're just reflective. And that's all they are, but they're non-reactive or non-emotional, except when it comes to sexuality. But even in an Antonioni film, sexuality doesn't seem to imply emotion, right? I can see where this, not necessarily the stoicism, but the stoic attitude is coming into play. I found that some of the scenes were a little overdramatic, though. It's definitely a melodrama. Yeah, like a melodramatic would be a better word. And there's like just points where she accidentally trips and Claudia, I mean, and she has her backpack filled with things. I think this is like a little past halfway. Yeah. And then they fall on the ground and she just kind of kneels down and then she sighs. Exactly. Like that really deep, heavy sigh, like this again kind of thing. Or even when she's elated or like, even when she's happy, it's the most, it's a very amplified, unreal version it just drips with unrealism a lot of the times when she's singing her song and jumping around or like i'll let you leave when you say that that without me you feel like you're missing a limb like things like that almost like it's not just reflections it's also projections too like these people are just empty vessels who are just kind of doing mimicry or just getting lost in in fleeting moments rather than institutionalized emotions or something like that uh i do want to um 
praised the cinematography in the film, especially the symmetrical framing techniques, where he would... Once again, you can see where Kubrick got a lot of inspiration for some of his shots, and uh, you can argue that Kubrick would, would do it better. But um, the way that Antonioni would frame his scenes or frame like the... Um, like the woman in between the, uh, uh, oh, it was Claudia, in between the uh, the drapes, right? In the room in the first scene. I mean, not only is that also an obvious foreshadowing, a liter literal metaphor for events to happen, but it's just perfectly framed and it's symmetrical and even ends in, um, that was actually probably one of my favorite frames in film, uh, the symmetrical, uh, the, the, the brick wall and the, uh, almost looked like a snow-covered peak, or at least just some, some sort of, island in the distance and our two completely discontented main characters directly in the middle of those two um, planes of modernity and where they uh, intersect or separate more likely where they disassociate actually it's probably the correct word to use and um, what did you think did you think the film had a message about like socioeconomic class like do you think it was saying anything directly about the upper class I would say yes, and the and the reason why is because it's just pointing out how, like, <clears throat> how we can be bored, or we can be disassociated with even that type of material wealth, where they're going out on some fun summer day in a yacht with no responsibilities and don't even talk about. The film doesn't even talk about their jobs. No. Like, not even at all. And there's, like, only one uh, dialogue scene where he talks about, like, what he, um, um, Sandro talks about, yeah. like, being one of those architects. And that's after he does the spilling of the ink onto that p particular painting that was not, that was half finished. And that Claudia happened. tells him, I think you can make beautiful things. Right. And that was funny because he, you could tell in that particular sh screenshot, um, that moment, he did on purpose spill the inkwell. Yes. Like it was deliberate, and he was accused that it was deliberate, and he denied it. And so it's this sort of like interplay between, uh, you know, the wealthy class saying they want to do things, but then they're in this sort of like this sickness. Right. And that sickness is like part of the reason why they're not creating anything new. They're just living in luxury and dying slowly. So do you think it's a moralistic film in a way? In a way, yeah, I do. And I think that's where he's making that social commentary. He's making the commentary in. And in, the, in a lot of different scenes, you see that. You see that they're searching for Anna, and then suddenly it's like uh, Anna's father comes in, and he's just like, oh, I can't be bothered with business. Yeah. Like, kind of thing. Like, that's really screwed up. But he leaves it on set. He leaves it up to the interpreter, to the w the watcher, uh, us, to see how that's going, how we put our value judgment onto that situation. Exactly. So I, th I thought that was pretty interesting, that he left it like that. And I think that's what Antonioni, what might also challenge a lot of people about Antonioni, because on this channel we've covered extensively people like Bergman, people like Tarkovsky, people who... Uh, are more about intuition and a lot more about feeling than Antonioni is. Uh, but perhaps that's why Bergman also called um, Antonioni a fucking bore, quotation marks on that. Um, and, and he loved Tarkovsky in contrast. Right. I think that's because Tarkovsky <clears throat> will, will, will film nature or film a building and allow it to speak for itself in a certain way. It's almost like guided meditation with Tarkovsky, whereas Antonioni, I do not believe let's really gives his viewers much free will in his films. I think he's just... Okay, yeah, I can see that. He is, like, so, uh... Not methodical in a Fritz Long way, but so, uh, deliberate. And so, um, anti-romantic to me. Like, very anti-romantic. Antonioni? Yeah. Yeah, that was very anti-romantic. And I think I pointed this out to you earlier, but I would like to just point it out again. How, in art, you, you're supposed to point out, or you're supposed to notice what is not only what is there but what is not there yeah, like there's a famous that, yeah. there's that famous painting where it's a train coming through a fire pit and there's no train tracks and it's just yeah out. that's a that's a magritte painting i yeah. love that painting so much yeah. yeah and in this particular film in la ventura or la ventura sorry uh you see the complete lack of physical contact <laughs> in the film except in a sexual context 
And it's like Almost a hypersexual constant. context. Yeah. And they're just, they're like, in some respects, they are, over, they are melodramatic, just like you were saying. They're melodramatic about the kissing scenes in some respects, or about the, the way they cried. <laughs> like, especially the last scene. <laughs> like, he's crying. Why are you crying? Like, I thought that last scene was brilliant. We'll get into yeah, the last scene later, but um, it's funny you brought up. Because I would call it anti-romantic, but his, his muse, who plays Claudia, uh, Monica Vitti, is um, re- ridiculously attractive. And very, very attractive. I do believe when she comes into his films, it's almost like since she must know Antonioni on a level, like a super esoteric, like almost mystical like bond with this director that like she almost transcends almost transcends Antonioni's anti-romantic language but in this film it's more I mean I can't say that it's not erotic at times I can't say that uh, the, the scene for some reason Antonioni liked to show us the backs of people a whole lot in I did notice film. that yeah um, there's like at least three different scenes in this one yeah, I'm thinking specifically of the scene in the beginning of the movie yeah. with, with Anna on the boat, and they they're undressing their backs Body are to us, and you see yeah. their 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 bare skin back, and that is erotic, but it's also duplicitous. I should use the word duplicitous because Antonioni, if that's a literal metaphor, then and if both women are have their backs turned to us, then they are, uh, in a sense, it's not about indecency from being nude; it's about like you're not going to be able to see inside either of these women, really. Like, it's about, uh, they're, they're, co- um, they're turning their backs to us, they're covering up from us, because maybe they're, they feel their emotions are indecent, or maybe Antonioni thinks that their emotional capacity is, uh, private or empty or just non-existent. If it's a literal metaphor, then it has to mean exactly that. I don't know if I would go that far. What I got from that particular scene was these two women being, and I do agree with the the concept of duplicity. They're being duplicitous. I would agree with that. Where I would diverge in my thinking is I would say that they were being guarded because they didn't want the revelation to be known that 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 it is empty. I could go there too. Yeah, I would say that would, that would to me be the more literal interpretation of turning your back. Because yeah. that would be a protection kind of thing. Because a lot of your it's most sensitive guarded. organs are in the front of your body. And if we follow the literal metaphor, they're they're guarded from us as viewers, because we are who they have their backs turned to, the viewer. You're right, exactly. Yeah. Which is why I would stipulate that particular mm-hmm. interpretation, because they're doing it to us rather than to Sandra or whomever is in the film. Yeah. So I, th- I found that pretty interesting that they, it was being turned toward us, their vaccine. So I don't know if I would call that eroticism then. Uh, can, can you. Can it, I-, I think it was erotic. I think it was. At the same time, I also think that it's like because he's playing with the idea of hedonism. Ah, uh, yeah. And so because he is, he's playing with this idea that, oh, there is this erotic pleasure seeking activity you can be a part of or other people can be a part of. But the they it's still that particular scene does not want to reveal itself as being as shallow and empty thing, and I thought that was what was interesting about that scene. And um, since we're almost on the subject of Monica Vitti as muse, were you able to see why Antonioni was fascinated by her, or, or mm-hmm. were you able to pull anything from her performance? What did you think of her in the film? I mean, overall performance, I thought she was very. Um, I would say more than captivating. She was sort of hypnotizing in a respect. That's it. Yeah, she's the hypnotizing quality yeah. of this piece. Certainly is. And the reason why I'd say that go that far is because she has this sort of like, she has this attitude about her. It's very, it's like well, what a lot of wealthy people during the 50s acted. Mm. They would have this sort of like reverence, silence, stoicism to them. But deep down inside, there's just like this churning pit of emotions. But then it's just like this below that, which is the next layer down, there's this sort of like emptiness, this existential exactly. dread. I would call her the quintessential like glacial blonde, the glacial yeah, blonde like the very, of yeah. all time. Um, especially since 
half the scenes that she's involved with with Sandro, she ends up staring off into the distance as if in some kind of vacant rumination. And you can't help but speculate as to what she's thinking. Either speculate as to what she's thinking. Um, You're never wondering what she's looking at. But maybe you just get lost in her. Like she's looking off and you're looking at her. But that's a bit more esoteric for this conversation. Um, I I do want to uh, resist intuition when it comes to Antonioni. And that's certainly an intuitive response that I just gave there. Because I think he's so deliberate. And uh, he's certainly a woman's director too. I think he's far kinder in the way that he frames his women in his films. How did you think of the way he he filmed the genders or portrayed the genders in this film, um, especially the men? Because the men, to me, were even more simple-minded, more vacuous. I think that's true to a degree, and a lot of that's definitely seen in Sandro, especially in how he interacts with women in his sort of this uh, shallow sort of <clears throat> fling based sort of like it's even more it's even more detached than that it's more like a an aloof exactly and it's like he can't help i do believe his tears at the end of the movie it may have been melodramatic but i believe them Hmm. i don't believe he was lying but i don't believe he was crying about the entire situation that's what i was gonna say i don't think he was crying about the situation and about leaving uh, anna disappearing i mean i think it was like yeah an overall i think he was crying because of existential yeah. dread more than this situation that had just occurred which was uh claudia finding him um in the arms of another wanting to escape which i do want to point out that that's the one scene with brief nudity you do see a nipple meaning that antonioni is calling that is applying value to that scene he is calling it indecent or he is calling it unique uniquely different what was the 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 one the scene with um, Sandro in the arm in the arms of the other um, in the last few scenes of the movie you see for a flash um, actual nudity whereas he would I didn't see completely that. flirt with the idea throughout the film especially with Monica Vitti and Anna and like turn at last second have them turn to us whereas this woman does not she's indecent even to this idea I, it, that was interesting to me. I didn't see. I'm, I didn't notice it. Maybe I was. In it was for like a flash, but it was certainly there, and I think it was really telling. I do want to talk about that that end scene really quick, as well. The final fifteen minutes, really, where it starts. the The film begins with a very fast paced melody, and then I don't believe we have music for like the rest of the film until the last fifteen minutes, where that same motif or same melody comes back in, and it's actually to me. It was quite disturbing, Monica Vitti alone in the in the room, looking at like the newspapers, things like that. Um, and also thought for some reason, the lighting that Antonioni was featuring Vitti at her most stunning, but also at her most dispossessed. At the same time, almost like her dispossession made her even more attractive in that moment, or she was actually realizing how dispossessed she was. And Which that, scene? Um, it was in the last fifteen minutes, but it was a. Uh, it was right before the conversation that she had with the woman about how I'm afraid that Anna's going to come back. I'm afraid. Oh yeah. It was one. It was very dark. It was very dark. Um, almost. Um, it was that was the only scene in the film that was framed like like a thriller, like some sort of cerebral uh, thriller. And I also believe it was also framed. Oh my god! Like 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 a waking nightmare. I really you know, do. I would actually go deeper than that if that's the case. If you're going to go that way with that, mm-hmm. I would like to say that that particular scene was actually representative of how change can bring us a sort of anxiety, which actually only fuels that existential dread more than if it were to take it away. And the idea here is she's thinking, what happens if the... So she's already disappeared, right? She's already been gone, and she's wondering if she does come back, what will she do? But then she's like, well, what if she actually does come back? Yeah. And then that just literally just adds more more fuel to the flame. It, it truly takes like a darker turn that is almost reminiscent of German expressionism given a neorealist twist. But like to go with what you're saying... It's at that moment where it's like purely ghost-like. It's at that moment where I feel like Anna stops becoming a person and starts becoming something that's haunting her. 
So yeah, like, like more like more. Yeah, it's less like Anna as a person and more like Anna as a conversation piece. And it's something that she's now dreading finding again. Yeah, you know, and and it's not even. It's not like he doesn't even go the Hitchcock route because like anyone like anyone Polanski De Palma anyone would have gone. Oh, she's simply somewhat taken the place of this woman. It's not even that Antonioni's not even interested in that concept. Right, and we do see that's true. That's that concept of Claudia being the new interest is completely destroyed in the last 30 minutes exactly. when he starts having another fling with a different woman. So you, you ha- you're you left with the idea that d- despite the fact that we that Sandro is the main character and Claudia is also the main character, we're still given this, this window into this wealthy Italian, these wealthy Italian families, lifestyles. And we're given this window of even here, even in when so many people are trying to get to this, so many people are trying to get to yeah. this status of of being so wealthy that they don't even have to work. And then even there, there's like this sort of emptiness that that is just it is unreal. Yeah, I would say that that is, that is unrealness. What do you think that infidelity and betrayal? means to Antonioni. Yeah. So I, I brought it up before, but I think, I think that's an important question. I think infidelity is definitely played throughout that. And we were making mention before how this has a moralistic undertone, like a moralistic commentary happening. And we're seeing that, um, the infidel infidelity of it is we, it's like, it's like Antonioni's playing with the idea that there's like a time window <laughs> and he's like saying, Oh, when's the acceptable time to accept that your lover's gone? When is that? Oh, well, let's just do three days. Just, and I wonder how he came up <laughs> with the idea of three days. Like what, what made him choose three? That's a fascinating question. Yeah. I love that though. Antonioni's time window. That's good. That is good. What do you think? Um, because there's a point where Claudia Monica Vitti like cries out for clarity, just wants to be able to see things clearly. What do you mm. think she means by that? I already said I think that I think that the characters are so empty, so clear and transparent that they're simply reflections rather than reacting to the situations around them. But what do you think she means by that? I would say it's almost like the actors themselves are asking the question <laughs> rather than it is the characters asking the question, which I find interesting. And that particular scene, it almost seems to me like the actors are the one grappling with whether their their contributions are meaningful or not. That's good. There was a lot of talk about art. Uh, the Italians seem to do that a lot. If mm-hmm. you watch a Fellini film from the same time period, there's a lot of commentary on art, and this film's no different. Um, it's not as articulately critical of art as as Fellini can be. Fellini had a really sharp tongue, but I I thought it framed the artistic world quite well. I think that that was uh, a really good attack on on class as well and privilege. What Mm -hmm. do you think? uh, What do you think? How many times? Take a shot every time I say those words, you guys. But, um... (laughs) And then also, when I say, but, um... Now... There's amazing cinematography and, and photography in this film. I, I think it's 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 poetically quite quite beautiful. Uh, it, it's a wonderfully captured film, from the ocean to the islands to some of the classical architecture to the the, the, the women in it, and I'm sure the men are, are beautiful too. But what do you think is beautiful to Antonioni? Do you think he thinks these things are beautiful, or is he trying to show that they're empty? Hmm, it's an interesting question. <sighs> I would have to say beautiful, and the reason why is in that beginning scene when you were showing, or you were describing how there was that just juxtaposition between Anna and Sandro in the room, sort of like making love, and then there's the window out in the distance, and it's showing Claudia behind the brick wall overseeing a landscape. And if you just focus on Sandro and Anna like I did, and you know that Claudia is in the background because you like you just for a brief moment, moment I looked out there and saw all of that. But if you focus on Anna and Sandro, you do see this almost like it's like there's color. Uh-huh, it's, yeah, it was really it was really surreal. 
like if you look in the background, clearly there isn't. But if you just focus on Anna and Sandro, it's like there is. There's this like color quality to it. And so then that is to me, me saying that even though there is beauty, it's like almost like there is beauty and emptiness. The emptier you are, the more beautiful you are in modernity, maybe? Like, I think he's a deeply pessimistic filmmaker. Would you agree? I think it well, it definitely had a pessimistic feel. So I'm going to go deeply pessimistic with it and say that the only things that he finds beautiful anymore is something deeply cynical. Hmm. And I think he, uh, he demonstrates that. That would be speculation. I wouldn't know. It would be speculation, but... I mean, based on some of the, some of his other, I've seen every one of his films. So I definitely, he's certain, he's super, not, he's super pessimistic, and he, he never lets up on that. Hmm. He, he he never relents in his cosmic pessimism when it comes to uh, when it comes to beautiful people, uh, when it comes to the upper class, when it comes to beauty, when it comes to modernization. And uh, does he do any films where he actually does play with? Um like what can it imbue meaning into someone's life? Or are they- does he ever have a film where a character actually does have a positive change yeah. or something? If not, then you might be on the button with that pessimism. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> wow. None. Either his characters are non-reactive and don't change whatsoever, or they get worse. <laughs> Dang. Literally, when I watch The Passenger, like Cleus Lenote, they get worse, or they get more disassociated. <laughs> Like <laughs> Antonioni, man. Um, but I just want to, I just love that last scene so much. That last scene will haunt me forever. The one, the one I'm talking about, the perfectly symmetrical thing. Cause it's, it's a perfect juxtaposition. You have the decayed architecture in contrast to the betrayed blonde. I don't know. I think it's just deeply poetic. And of course I become, <laughs> Uh, noticeably more expressive when we start focusing on Monica Vitti because uh, like Antonioni or on account of Antonioni's photography, I'm also hypnotized by her, mesmerized by her, obsessed would actually be a pretty proper word if you've watched any of my love letter videos mm -hmm. on Antonioni's films. I spend quite a bit of time on what VT not only means to me but certainly to Antonioni and the only hints of optimism, even if it's cynical, <clears throat> it's it's there, Michelangelo. I can see it. You you believe in Monica somehow. You believe in her. Maybe not that much, but you do. <laughs> but you do. You're, you're a pessimist, but you believe in her beauty, and there's something remarkable about it. Maybe even esoteric. Maybe it'll even charge you with that, that you're trying to capture, and you do succeed in it. Um, in every film that you have her in, especially in La Ventura, which I do really... I, I really do like La Ventura. I think it's I think it's a pretty fantastic film with a really interesting language. Uh, it's really fun to absorb. I love it. Uh, yeah, I would like to just um, jump in and talk a little bit about the poetic nature of this entire film. I, I really appreciate the stillness of it and how. I think a lot of people will mistake this film as being boring and that's missing the point because it's meant to be. Yes. And I think that's more in line with what, what you mean by poetic because it's doing that on purpose and then making a commentary on top of that, that boredom, that, that sort of, sort of <clears throat> lingering cinema, the not even cinematic, the, the um, scenic quality. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Those who say that the film is boring are completely missing the point. Mm -hmm. And and that's fine, because uh, this movie was a very controversial film at the Cannes Film Festival, when where it, where it originally premiered. Not a lot of people liked it. Like I said, he's a love him or hate him kind of guy, but I don't think Antonioni cares. Because I think, I, I believe in his vision, and I believe in his films. La Note is one of my favorite films. It's actually my number three favorite film of all time. I think it's fascinating. But La Ventura is the beginning of the of the beautiful screen language uh, that would become uh, just purely and distinctively Antonioni. It was his La Dolce Vita, you know, when Fellini started stepping outside the bounds of, uh, of neorealism. This is Antonioni doing the same thing, finding his own uniqueness as an artist, as an auteur, as a true auteur. Do you have any closing statements? 
Yeah, I wanted to comment about <clears throat> not only the, uh, the, the, the disparaging shots, but I also wanted to talk about how the entire film was basically talking about, um, I, don't, I don't know, just like the overall, the, it's just the, the lack of resolution, the lack of finality, the, the lack of conclusion. I found that more than anything poignant to that poetic fact, to the fact that there's this sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't know how else to describe it, like a, an anxiety under the surface of everything. And that was more than anything what I was imparted with. I was imparted with the lack of resolution, the lack of finality. And in those last scenes, um, especially the very last scene, when Sandro and Claudia are crying, and she's hesitant to even put her hand on him. And for the first time in the entire film, you see uh, you know, contact, physical contact that is not sexual in nature. It's just yeah, the hand, the hand on the back of the head, and she's really hesitant to do so mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's not only the, the 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 base material of it, the betrayal that just occurred, but it's way more. It's like like you said, an actual reaction. They're finally being reactionary, but still, it doesn't resolve anything. Exactly. There is no resolution. It's like it's a it's lack more an of, affirmation. Yeah, an affirmation of the lack of resolution. That was pretty poignant. Yeah, like it's like existential claustrophobia, but in an extraordinarily open space. Like it's a, it's a I don't know, I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think that's really fascinating. La Ventura. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I would I would highly recommend doing so. All the cool kids are doing it. But yeah, this is Zach and David, and we just want you to have um, just have a good time and. Uh, See you next time when we discuss something else. Thanks for watching. Bye.